what I'm going to do is um, I'll just briefly go through how I'm going to attack this. It's a massive sub subject migration. There are people who are, uh, have studied one bird's migration all their lives. And, and such a broad type topic, it's going to be difficult to um, speak about everything about migration in 40 minutes. So I'm really only going to cover the basics, but I hope um, I hope it will be interesting for you. And we'll, what we'll do is we'll start off talking about the world's migration routes, and then we'll talk about European ones. And then we'll hone down on the, the routes that birds take in the UK and what migrant birds that we may encounter. Um, and finally, towards the end, we'll play some bird song of some of our exciting spring migrants that, that we should be able to find in our local area. So this graphic that you're seeing now is um, a very basic graphic of world migration routes. And why I'm using this is because I want to explain that actually all the time, all over the world, there is migration. And being a birder in England, we can get actually quite in, um, enraptured with our own region or country and actually think that it's only happening here. It isn't, it's happening all over the world and it's happening to species that we wouldn't even think would be migrants. Most birds are moving. There are very few birds that are sedentary or called sedentary, the examples being hedge sparrow, house sparrow, nuthatch, but even robins um, can migrate. Um, so I think that just gives us an idea with this, uh, with that uh, graphic. Um, moving on to um, this uh, European graphic, ignore, uh, I must preface this, ignore the yellow one, that's an Asian migratory route. There are three main routes in Europe for migration, um, as is the red one, um, so you're getting birds coming in from Scandinavia, Iceland, Siberia, Northern Europe moving down th um, through the UK, maybe staying in the UK, through France, through Spain, into Africa, uh, mainly Central Africa, underneath the Sahara, the Sahel region, S-A-H-E-L, and some of them are even going all the way to South Africa. Um, and back again. Um, and then the middle route, the Central European route, it's a, um, so you're getting again birds from Northern Europe and Siberia, excuse me while I, um, and then through Germany, through Italy, through Tunisia, and again, Central and Southern Africa. And then this amazing green uh, migratory route, which I advise you post COVID, if you get a chance to go to this, uh, uh, go somewhere interesting on the Via Pontica. Um, it's, it's amazing, it, it's like a funnel, as you can see, it stretches from the Rhine in Germany, um, going eastwards all the way to the Crimea, and then it funnels into around, in Europe, around Romania and Bulgaria, uh, the Black Sea, and then it comes through uh, Middle East, East Africa, and interestingly, some of the species of birds that are coming down into Central Africa will actually match the species that are coming down from our Western Red Route. Um, they just obviously come from a different direction. And again, there'll be birds coming down all the way to South, um, Southern Africa. Um, so what are they doing? I mean, what's, uh, why are they choosing these routes? Well, you can see that actually, just from that simple graphic, they're minimizing sea passage. So they're aiming for bits where the sea, they've got short sea crossings. And on the, on the Via Pontica, the green route, you will, they're also, some of the bigger birds will be ma maximizing um, any, any energy advantages they can get from the route. So classically, therm good thermals develop on coastal sites. Um, so where there's a difference in temperature between the land and the sea, thermals occur and the bigger birds such as eagles, other birds of prey, storks, pelicans coming through Romania and Bulgaria are using these thermals so uh, and, and it's amazing they're just not flapping their wings for uh, it's just amazing to watch them um, 
and so the the other the other obvious reason for these roots is that they over time over even um thousands of years of time these birds all birds have found out where they they can maximize their food advantages and before i go more specifically into um the uk i just want to do some i'm going to talk about a couple of birds which are just amazing in in um well, and, and how many miles they travel and how they do it. Um, and I'm just put this graphic up just to explain that there are different, although I said uh, on the last slide, most birds will minimize the amount of sea crossing. However, there are different strategies for different birds. Um, and over evolution, if we take the Gulf of Mexico as an example, Many of the birds, it's under spring migration now, they're com coming from South America, through Central America, into North America. And they will be traveling around the western side of the Gulf of Mexico because there's lots of stop-offs for food. However, there are some songbird species that actually won't. They will travel all the way across um, that uh, amazing expanse of sea. And the advantage for them is that when they get to the breeding areas, they get in there quicker, they've got more chance of uh, establishing a nest site. It may be an optimum time for the particular food that they're eating. The obvious advantage using the other strategy is that you've got plenty of stopovers that you can gain energy and food, but you will arrive at your destination at a later stage in the season. Now, this bird is amazing. Uh, to, this is an example. There are many examples of unbelievable migration. This, the red knot, it's a small wader, which we get in this country. And this graphic shows different, different routes it takes. So it's a common bird, it's a common wader. It's found all over the world. The red part in the middle is, is the red knots we see. They come in from Greenland and Iceland. They travel down the East Coast. Uh, if you're lucky enough to encounter them, um, I'll mention Kent a lot because Kent's only an hour in the car or by public transport. You can get to the North Kent marshes once this COVID thing's out of the way. You can get to the Swale Estuary. I advise you to do it. It's the closest place to see birds like this and they'll be in their thousands. It's spectacular. The Norfolk coast regularly gets 40,000 knot. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is the one that uses the purple root. So if we go right to the right hand side of this graphic, the red knot, there is one subspecies of red knot. It goes from places like New Zealand, Australia, New Guinea, travels across the China Sea to mainland China, feeds up and then goes to Siberia, northern Siberia, the eastern side uh, and breeds. Then it comes all the way back again. Now, about 10 years ago, I mean, and I'm, I'm just describing it, it's five ounces, about 24 centimetres. That's the average dimensions of this bird. This, this one's in breeding plumage, hence red knot. Um, and I was told about 10 years ago that how amazing this bird was and that several individuals on that migratory route will go across the sea when they come back and they physiologically change. They have to feed up big time, they're bred in Siberia and they've decided to come straight back across the sea. They're not doing stopovers over the land and it takes them five days and five nights. They don't land in the sea. That's constantly flying. Yeah, unbelievable, I thought. Well, technology has moved on um, rapidly and with devices that we can put, the, the devices we can put on these birds now to see where they travel. And one study of the red knot in this migratory route has recently come up with two individuals that spent eight days traveling 10,000 kilometers without stopping. Absolutely mind blowing, stunning. And we can see these birds um, on our migratory route. They, at, when they, going back to what I said, they literally, they're almost a different bird when they come back. After they bred, they lose this wonderful red plumage because that 
when when birds are breeding that takes energy to create these wonderful colors takes energy they need to conserve that to do this amazing flight but the other things will happen they will feed up massively to put on muscle mass uh, they'll so they'll put on fat and protein but also their internals totally change most of their internal organs will literally shrink to give give them more room for this muscle mass. It literally changes physiologically into a, almost a different bird. Stunning. And then there's the cuckoo. Now, you, a lot of us will probably have seen because um, the BTO's um, uh, has tagged many cuckoos and it's been, um, well, not many, they do about half a dozen a year and it's, but it's a scheme that's been going on for years to see exactly what routes uh, the cuckoo takes and we always thought that they came to came to our country and then they traveled back um, to West Africa to underneath the Sahara and they use the coast well some of them do but some have a strategy some individuals actually travel across the Sahara but there's a cuckoo um, cuckoos are found all over the world and there are some that use other migratory routes and this there's one individual that was found in 2020 has now got the longest recorded mainland um, distance that it traveled 7500 miles stunning what these birds can do okay let's get on to the uk so i'm only there are lots of different kinds of migration but i'm only going to concentrate on the two ones that we really come across and um, so that's an autumn migration and mainly these birds are coming from colder climes and they're coming to feed up because there is less food or no food from where they're coming from. Um, and then we have a spring migration where the birds are coming over generally to breed. So let's concentrate first on the UK autumn migration. Generally, the birds are coming from Iceland, they're coming from uh, Scandinavia, and some will be traveling all the way from Siberia. And we're, we're well placed because a lot of these birds will be taking an eastern seaboard route, so close to us. There are some birds that take a western route, but we are well placed to be part of this migration and uh, experience it. In fact, for water birds and waders, uh, the UK is internationally important because of the numbers that stop over to feed up. Um, because of all the estuarine and mudflat environments that occur on our coastline, particularly the eastern coastline. Um, and then I'll talk about our pastoring birds that also come from Scandinavian climes after we've looked at some water birds. So what are we going to see or what potentially can we see? So I'm, this is no way comprehensive of all the species we can see because we've only got 40 minutes to talk. But is, here's some nice examples. On the left, we've got the Brent goose. It's, quite, it's a small goose it, when we compare it to a Canada goose or a grey lag goose. They come in thousands. Um, best seen for us, closest would be the Kent coast, uh, Norfolk coast, Essex coast. And I've experienced one, wonderful things where I've been in, seeing them in their thousands and they fly over, they'll be in the estuary and then they'll fly over your head and land in the field to eat the rye grass. And it's just stunning. And they've got actually a quite soft voice. But to see that amount of birds and they, they'll be traveling, they'll only be 50 foot above you. It's stunning to see. On the right is a white fronted goose, bigger goose, very similar looking to the gray lag goose, but you notice that it's got a white part to its uh, uh, above the bill, hence white fronted goose. Um, and again, they come on the East Coast and you classically see them in the same places where you see Brent geese and they'll, they'll in fact will be eating together. However, interestingly, this year uh, in January, we had what's called in migratory terms a fall. So in London, and a fall means that birds landed in London and there was two white-fronted geese found in Clapton Common. There was a couple on Blackheath. There was some in the central London parks, only in small numbers. And one in Burgess Park in Southwark, uh, which stayed for a week. It um, happily fed 
with the grey lags and happily flew with them and happily swam around with them. But not, not only that, that was a really rare occurrence because the white fronted goose has a couple of subspecies. One comes all the way from Siberia. Um, the UK generally gets about 2,000 of them. In other words, not many. Uh, the other species tends to come from Scandinavia, a bit closer, and there's about 20,000 visitors. Um, and we were lucky in this fall to get Siberian subspecies. So that's right on our doorstep, this wonderful bird turned up. These birds are a series of ducks, three of them we're more likely to see in our local parks. Um, certainly with the shoveler top left, looks a bit in coloration like a mallard, but you can see that massive beak, hence its name, shoveler. And all, um, when you do see them, you'll notice that they often feed by round and round in circles. So what they're doing is stirring up the water, stirring up their food to get to the surface. And then they use that wonderful bill, which has a sieve-like um, membrane um, to uh, catch and then eat the food. Uh, and interestingly, in behavioural terms, they'll be different to a mallard because they won't come to bread. Um, and then underneath, so shoveler, you could see on most of the, the local lakes, you'll get them on Dulwich Park Lake, Crystal Palace Park Lake, South Norwood Country Park, any of the London urban lakes. Um, underneath it, that wonderful, beautiful um, male pochard in in uh, its breeding livery and that wonderful um, contrast between that orange brown head and the gray, stunning bird. Um, less common, um, but there is one on Burgess Park Lake as we speak, it's been the long standing bird. It's been around there for a couple of months. Um, so check it out if you can. Well, you can see these birds on other lakes as well. On the right of the pochard, you've got the teal, quite a small duck, less, uh, I have seen them on our urban lakes, but they're generally more of a, to be seen at low tide on the Thames, on the mudflats, um, and in numbers. Again, on the Kent coast, uh, there'll be thousands of these birds. Uh, London Wetland Centre is a good place to see teal. And then above it is the golden eye, probably the rarest uh, of these birds generally, and particularly rare in urban environments only comes to visit London a few days a year, generally, and on big waterways. So things like reservoirs, uh, Walthamstow reservoirs or King George VI reservoirs. However, in January this year, um, for three days on Burgess Park Lake, a beautiful male like that, you can see that wonderful golden eye and the white patch on its cheek, breeding plumage with that lovely green fluorescence. Uh, stuck around for three days. They, um, they do eat vegetation, but they also like mollusks. So there's obviously something on the man-made bottom of the man-made lake, presumably snails, that uh, it was happily feeding on. And it came, it was, the week, it was the week after the RSPB Garden Bird Watch. And interestingly, last year, the golden eye for three days was on Burgess Park Lake, after the weekend of the RSPB Garden Bird Watch, which says to me it was the same bird. Um, I do advise you, if you're local, to go to that lake. I think for water birds, it's interesting. It's, um, it, it has good vistas. The birds can see this lake. A lot of lakes, of our smaller lakes, there is mature trees around and they're perhaps not as visible. And that's my pet theory why uh, Burgess Park Lake is coming up with some of the interesting birds in the very local area. Okay, continuing on autumn migration, these birds, the, the bird on the left, red wing, there's still a smattering about in our local parks. It's a really interesting last, uh, these two weeks are very interesting, these early March, late March weeks, because we've got the end of autumn migration and with the beginning spring migration. So we're now starting to hear some of our spring migrants. So there's a crossover. So the red wings at the moment, I saw some in Bel Air Park on Monday, feeding up and obviously very close to going back to their uh, winter, uh, sorry, their, their breeding haunts um, in Northern Europe and, <coughs> and Scandinavia. 
these come can come in hundreds lo even locally if you um they come in two swathes usually around the end of october early november we get we get a first lot of red wings coming in and then when it gets colder around january we often get another lot of red wing in and the first the first lot of birds, they're thrushes, so they eat the same as blackbirds and um, song thrush and missile thrush, and they'll be after the berries. And it's been a particularly good berry season. And I noticed the birds in Bel Air Park on Monday were actually eating berries in the ivy. But usually what happens is the first, the berries go before Christmas, and then after Christmas, the birds feed on fields just like blackbirds and song thrush, and they're looking for earthworms. And you can get spectacular, you can come across, encounter spectacular amounts. I've had, Dulwich Park, I've had 100. The biggest lot I had was 500 on the playing fields at Turney Road, um, because it's undisturbed, there's no dogs or dog walking. I've had 500, the year of the beast, I had 500 on Peck and Rye Park the first day after the white went and they were just people were walking through them they were so hungry on the right is another thrush the field fair another one of our scandinavian cousins it's a bigger bird haven't seen too many of these this year but again they prefer uh, easterly coast route there's certainly been numbers in kent and essex and norfolk this year and again they're eating the same amount and can indeed if we get them in London, uh, be seen with the red wing. And uh, finally, on the autumn, that some some examples of our autumn migrants. These are Scandinavian finch cousins of our um, of our finches. On the uh, all three of these, it's a possibility a possibility to get them in your garden if you're very lucky on your feeder. Um, but generally, the, if we take the beautiful siskin on the left, um, they love alders. So anywhere where there's alders, very local alders in Bel Air Park and the little lake on the South Circular. Haven't seen them this year. They usually, uh, if they're here, they'll be busily feeding on the alders with goldfinch. Um, I saw them in Beckham, uh, no, where was it? Not Beckenham Place Park. Uh, Beddington Park, not Beddington Farmlands, Beddington Park. Lesser red pole. I always have a rule of thumb with lesser red pole. If it's a cold day in January, look at the birches. Look at the top of silver birch anywhere you are, and you may get a chance of a flock of lesser red pole. And uh, I'm not always right on that, um, but it usually is a cold day when they come out. They can be sometimes difficult to spot the red pole on its top um, often they are right at the top of a birch and often it's poor contrast um, of colors because it, um, we're seeing them with a, against a gray sky on the right brambling is has been rarer certainly in the last couple of years i've seen very few of them a bit more uh, sizable than the other two finches more like a chaffinch size um, when they do come, they can come in numbers. And last year there was a, what's called in migratory terms an eruption. And in, I think it was Czechoslovakia in the central forest. They had five and a half million of them busily feeding. Okay, let's get on to the exciting part, which we're involved in now. Spring migration. It's already started. There are birds that have already flown. Um, so our first migrants can actually come in around the last week of February. And it's about now that we start getting um, a few more species and then second week of April, it really starts motoring. And then there's some of the later migrants will come in May, um, come in here to breed and then they start dispersing back to their African haunts around August, September. So that's the sort of route they're taking. Um, not a very good graphic, I know. I'm as useless with my arrows. But a lot of these birds are coming from south of the Sahara, the Sahel, 
uh, using uh, going up through West Africa, looking through a short seacoast route, going through France and Spain. And of course, again, we're well placed because they're hitting the UK on the south and the east coasts. And so London is particularly well placed. Um, and then uh, some of the birds also, that other arrow is supposed to de denote that other birds we are getting from even deeper um, in Africa, all the way from South Africa. Um, we also get what's called being short distance migrants. It's still a long way um, from the Iberia Peninsula or Northern uh, Africa. And they're coming, as I said, they're coming to breed. These, I'm just, this is a very quick slide. These can be early migrants, the Metapipit and Wheatear, both seen on the ground, but it tends, unfortunately, although they come in numbers, um, particularly Metapipit, unfortunately, they do like landing on grasslands, so they get disturbed very quickly. And if you haven't caught them at six o'clock in the morning, then they've gone. Um, easy on the coast, though, on the coast of Wheatear, um, they can, if you do actually see wheat eat there, um, they're very confining birds. You can get quite close to them. Right, let's get on to some examples that we can see quite easily. I'm starting off with the black cat. You can see what I put on the right where you're liable to come across them. Mature deciduous woodland and increasingly in parks and even in our gardens, uh, but nests slow down. And this is a point where I do a little bit of uh, lecturing. Okay, because these birds, these next, I think it's five birds, they're all warblers and all of them tend to nest in scrubby habitat um, and, and often low down, which means that cosmeticizing our parks and gardens is not a good thing for them. Um, being neat and tidy is not what they want. Um, anyway, end of lecture. There's the black cap, obvious why it's called the black cap. The female has a brown cap. Um, and this bird has a, sometimes is called, one of its nicknames is the mock nightingale. <laughs> Took a while to start up, didn't it? But when it starts, it's just a beautiful sound. It's also an amazing mimic. So classically, all the books will tell you it will mimic the garden warbler, which has a similar sound. It mimics the garden warbler because it says, I'm a garden warbler. I'm in your... I've got my territory, go away, find your own. Two, two, maybe three seasons ago, I'm walking up Sydney Mill Woods, at the bottom of Sydney Mill Woods, a black cap, male black cap, just like this, straight in front of me, landed in a bush and sang a blackbird song, almost all the way through, and I couldn't believe it. It was just like a blackbird, so I've got no witnesses to this. I'm pinching myself. I can't believe this. And he did it again. But what he was doing, he had obviously encountered a male blackbird. It, it had got its territory. And it was saying, Mr. Male Blackbird, go and find your own place to breed because I found my place. Amazing. Next up, the chiff chaff. The chiff chaff's already arrived. Um, I've written a little piece if you want to have a look at it because this bird. I don't have favourites, but this bird always makes me smile because, as the swallow says, that we we know the swallow is traditionally thought of as the uh, harbinger of summer. Chiff chaff says to me, "Spring is here." Suddenly, the evenings are a bit longer. Suddenly, it's a bit warmer, and they can come as early as February, late uh, late February, but traditionally, it's now, and they are they are already in. They'll still be coming in. They're a common migrant. They're a successful bird. Um, and if you remember a couple of slides back, I said there are short distance migrants. This is known as a short distance migrant. So it's typically its wintering grounds would be the Iberia Peninsula and 
North, uh, Northern Africa. But let's put this in context. You know, a short distance migrant. This this bird is about eleven grams. Uh, I always say this: go home, measure out two teaspoonfuls of sugar, and that's it. That's what it weighs. And this bird has come all the way from southern Spain to come and see us. Stunning. And what I love about it is also it's got a simple, very distinctive voice. Now, there was a crow in the background, I, I believe. That distinctive, quite metallic, two notes. Chip chap, chip chap. Scientific name polybeta, which means is, I believe, Latin or Greek for loose change in your pocket. Hence the metallic thinking we got from it. They are around. And if, uh, again, open woodland, um, close to water often. So around Dulwich Park Lake, around Bel Air Park Lake. Everywhere, really, where there's some open woodland, and but they do nest low down. Uh, so be careful um, of disturbing what look like rough patches. Uh, then I'll just flick between that. This is the willow warbler. This is again a leaf warbler. So its first scientific part of its scientific name is Philoscopus, just like Chiffchaff. Philoscopus scoping leaves. So they're looking at leaves and trees for insects. Very similar, very similar birds. But notice the eagle eyed of, of you may notice that the chiff chaff has black legs and its close relative has paler legs. It also has longer wings. And this is because this is a long distance or, or deemed a long distance migrant and is coming from Central Africa. They come in numbers to this country. Traditionally, they are going down slightly in, um, in overall abundance. I believe there's amber concern at the moment. I may be wrong there. Um, but they still come in numbers. Unfortunately, they don't tend to stay too long in southern urban environments. So when we encounter them, uh, they're, not, they're not staying. They're passing through, going further up north in the country, um, sticking around for maybe a day, a couple of days and feeding up. But the really distinctive feature about them compared to the chiff trap is their song. Isn't that beautiful? So that lilting sort of descending full song, which is quite different to those metallic two notes that we got from the chiff trap. Another beautiful songster. So as I say, harder to, to de detect because they don't stick around, tend to stick around, they don't tend to nest. If you're lucky enough, they make an amazing nest, a bit like a long tail tit's nest, a dome shaped with a hole in the side. Um, but you can encounter them first and second week in April. Would uh, I've had them in Sydney Mill in the usual uh, local haunts, um, Sydney Mill, Hill Woods, um, Bel Air Park, Dulwich Park, uh, and Peckham Rye. The white throat. This is quite uh, is another warbler, another warbler that's come from a long way, Central Africa. This is, this is quite different though, different environment it's looking for. It's not looking for trees, it's looking for lowland scrub. Now, of course, in parks, we tend to get rid of scrub. Um, so, but there are two places where we get decent numbers of these birds breeding. One is um, Burgess Park, where they get up to seven or eight territories. You'll notice in Burgess Park, there are um, big uh, quite big sizable lumps of scrub they're about 20 to 30 feet um, wide around six foot high very dense and that's what the white throat wants and another good place is south Norwood country park they get serious numbers of uh, territories up to 20 territories of this bird and distinctive 
um, voice, very scratchy. And I'm hard in the background, so it must have been close to water. It's great to see when they first come in, the males, they, the males tend to come in first and they haven't got a mate, so they display, they'll be displaying on the top of the scrub and they go into this amazing little flight, singing that scratchy song, and then they sort of flutter down, showing off their best dance moves. Great birds. And then reed warbler, another warbler, another warbler that, um, guess what, it likes reeds. So what's interesting is that reed warblers are one of the few species doing not too bad in the UK. And that's because not just London, but urban environments have tended to increase their number of reeds because reeds have other positive ben benefits to water. Um, so there's been an increased planting of reeds generally in urban environments, but also because of climate change, reeds tend to be growing slightly earlier, which allows the early reed warblers that perhaps weren't as successful before um, to be successful in their, their nesting. So in other words, there's a longer period, it's created a longer period for their breeding season. Reed warblers, so you wanna look for a place with reeds. Um, Again, South Norwood Country Park around the lake there, you will get reed warbler. You will get reed warbler reading. There's usually one territory on the small lake in Clapham Common. Uh, I think Wandsworth Common gets a reed warbler as well. And Burgess Park gets up to three reed warblers. So you can see if you, anybody knows Burgess Park, the reeds aren't particularly dense. They're not particularly big, um, but you can get up to three territories. One territory last year was literally five feet away from a fisherman, from one of the um, fishing locations. Dulwich Park reeds, but I, I, and I don't know why this is, um, um, do not, they have had reed warbler, but not breeding. It tends to be lonesome males who come late in the season. And I always think these, their song, which we'll hear in a minute, is really evocative of this Central African savannah. And I think it's just amazing that in Burgess Park, you can go, you can hear a bird that's come from the savannah to the old Kent Road, and it shares that fantastic, exotic um, sound. Stunning. Okay, and then House Martins will start coming, these are the flyers, if you like, the, the ones that are eating insects in the air, slightly different to the passerines we've just seen. Um, I'm very well aware of time. I am going on a bit at the moment, so we've got a only a few slides left. So the house martin tends to come in quite early. Uh, Swiss, I say May the 4th for East Dulwich. Everybody has a date for, for when their Swiss come in. Um, I'll just concentrate on the, the first three and I'll talk about the hobby later. House Martin, in the late 80s, early 90s, when I first came to SE22, there were reportedly 50 breeding pairs in the area. I think that took into account SE24 as well and SE21. Now, I got a report of one nest last year and we don't know whether they were successful in raising their chicks. Stunning losses, and a really good example of what is happening to most bird species and insect species. Um, and it's not just us, a lot of people have put the blame on redoing houses, they classically make a mud nest in the eaves of uh, houses. And then the other thing is, is you come out your front door and not to put too fine a point on it, they, you get feces um, dropped on you. Um, so people clean up the nests and they've got no nesting site because they are 
what's deemed site faithful. They come back to the same place every year. But we do have to realise within all this, it, it, the, it, um, that it's global. There are things happening also on their wintering grounds. Their habitat is changing. And this is the same for all birds. And if we look at the swift, we do get a fair number in East Dulwich and Dulwich, Forest Hill, uh, but the numbers are going down, definitely. Again, they are looking for the ease of houses. An amazing bird. You could, I could do an hour or maybe two hours on the swift. It does everything on the wing, everything. It makes love on the wing. It drinks on the wing. It eats on the wing. It sleeps on the wing. An amazing bird. The only time it has over evolution, it's got, um, uh, it, it has very, very short legs because the legs are not needed except when they're crawling in for breeding, um, which is in there. Uh, they don't become adults for three or four years. Amazing birds. Swallows uh, around us locally, they tend to pass through. They're not going to, we tend not to see them too much, only if we're lucky. And I was lucky. Um, around five years ago, I'm walking in Dulwich Park. It's, they're going back to Africa. It's end of August. I'm standing. I'm getting swallows, probably a dozen to 20 at a time. They're flying uh, around three feet, catching insects, and they're just on their way, catching insects in the air, going over the lake, on their way to Africa. When that happens, it's just magical. And every five minutes, another 20 had come along feeding. I was just very, very lucky. And then finally here, I'll put the hobby because the hobby, a bird of prey about the size of a kestrel, another falcon, comes all the way from West Africa, comes and visits us, um, breeds here, um, can feed on some of these um, insect eating birds, but generally it's looking for um, our summer flying insects, dragonflies. So typically it will feed up uh, across water. So London Wetland Centre, they, um, every year they tend to get hobbies. Locally, we have had hobbies. I've never been able to locate the nest, um, but uh, we didn't get them last year. But the year before, for about five years, they were on around the Dulwich woods border, looking over the golf course and obviously feeding over the golf course. Um, they tend to they tend to be lazy like uh, a lot of birds of prey in their nest uh, making nests they usually steal crows nests um, so can be seen they used to be a pair at South Norwood Lake if anybody knows that which is halfway down Annerley Hill they used to be again this is a bird that's site faithful they always had a pair but I, I haven't had any reports for a couple of years these two birds, and we are getting close to the end. Uh, these two birds, it's not so much migration, but there is movement, and they are a signature of our changing climate. And both of them can be seen and heard in local confines. The, the Chetty's warbler, so it's pronounced Chetty, uh, French, after a French zoologist. Um, it's a bird that's increased its range, and that's because, uh, and, and its breeding range, and that's because of our climate has got warmer, and um, particularly found in southern England in increasing amounts. Didn't start breeding here, I think, uh, it's around 1972 they first bred here. Um, and there is one been for the last week. It's the first time locally I can say this um, in Burgess Park, uh, in the reeds and flying into somebody's garden. May still be around. May breed. On the right, the firecrest, similar, it's extended its breeding range, um, another signature of climate change. And the firecrest is very similar to its uh, brother, the goldcrest, very small, kinglet bird. Um, around, I think they're about eight grams, the smallest uh, British bird is, is the goldcrest. They're very similar in their habits, very similar in size except the firecrest has this amazing white eye stripe along with that wonderful gold, um, sorry, fiery orange crest. They both eat in the same environment. So look at evergreens, 
look at the used Sydenham Hill Woods for years now, it's had pie crest, and we know that they bred last year, which is fantastic. They're a rare bird, didn't start breeding in the UK until 1962, so still rare. Great to see they're successful in a very local environment. Oh, I needed to preface that. Now, the Chetty's Warbler, you'll never see. I, hats off to this person who took this photo because I've known photographers been by a bush for an hour and not got any images at all. They're incredibly furtive. So when you're on your travels and you come across a Chetty's Warbler, yeah, 95% of the time you'll see a flitting sort of shadow, but you will get this. Absolutely astonishingly loud, and it will. I, I guarantee you, you walk by a bush, you won't see the bird, it'll be three feet from you, and it'll just burst into that song, and you will be taken aback. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so some resources before we finish obviously, RSPB and BTO uh, for general information about birds, which is trust for ornithology. More on a migration level, um, there are a series of bird observatories around the UK. Um, the one on the southern coast is the Portland Observatory at Portland, Bill. And it, that's a good place if you want to look what's coming in at any one day. There's a daily list of birds that they've seen. And, and of course, they're amazing. You know, they're in a great position to see them because they're right by the sea. They actually see them coming across the sea sometimes. And then London Birders. London Birders is a, has a wiki digest, a daily digest. You don't have to have a password. Just go on that site, see what's coming in, see what's coming in locally. And then you can always get hold of me. Um, that's my email and my Twitter handle. Uh, there's thank you to the people who provided the references for this talk. And finally, some credits the photos, wonderful photos and wonderful sounds we heard. Um, so we've got lots of time for questions. And if, uh, if we run out of time, then you're welcome to email me um, if need be. Thank you.